<laughs> There's no consequences for them if they beat me and rob me. If I do not act right now to defend myself, I'm toast. I'm flattened in the pavement. So I was sentenced to three years of probation, 40 days in jail, and 240 hours of community service. Now the jail days were to be served on weekends, which isn't even real jail. Yeah, it's still cumbersome. It's a big um, appearances. Um, uh, and you basically sit in there all day and watch movies with 20 or 30 other guys. They bring you two crappy bologna lunches. And then you go home for the night. You sleep in your own bed, you get to check your email, you get to eat a real meal. Then on Sunday, you come back and do it again. Now, I had uh, 12 days credit served already, plus four days of good behavior, so that was a balance of 24 days that I did on that throughout the summer of 2017. Um, originally, the original sentencing, he changed it a little bit from uh, what the pretrial release officer had done. Um, the judge initially ruled that I could not film any person as my uh, special conditions, in addition to the normal things that uh, when someone's on probation. So five weeks later, we were able to get some of that lifted. Um, I still have a lot of First Amendment restrictions. I am banned from filming protests. I am banned from filming anything at PSU. I can't film my own speech right now. If I film my own speech, I go to prison. You know, there's a lot of this rhetoric about Trump's attacks on the media. <laughs> Has Trump ever threatened to throw someone into prison for engaging in their First Amendment rights? I'm experiencing that right now. It's not Trump threatening that. It's the judges in Multnomah County that are threatening that. But I'm not banned from going to political events, which I think is interesting because if the judge is ordering that as a way to protect the public because he doesn't want the incident to happen again, doesn't want a, a redo of everything, then why aren't I banned from going to political events in the first place? Because if it was my intention to do that, having a camera or not wouldn't matter. In fact, if it was my intention to do that, why would I bother following that order in the first place? <laughs> so while I was in weekend jail, I was actually denied some deferrals to work. Um, I had been offered some uh, weekend work. I do a lot of freelance work, video production stuff. Um, I had been issued, uh, offered some work throughout that summer. And uh, I had heard some other guys doing weekend jail um, who were able to get permission to defer some of those days. Uh, where they can go to work, and then the, the days that they miss just get added on at the end of their thing here. Uh, I was denied that. You have these other guys who are approved to do that. Yeah, I, there were other guys in there who weren't even asking for permission to take a weekend off. They just weren't showing up. One guy wanted to go rafting on the river with his buddies because the weather was nice out. Another guy, he was scared. He was a younger guy. Um, he didn't know what was going to happen, so he just didn't show up because he was scared. He actually tried to turn himself in at the normal jail later that week. They didn't want, they didn't take him. There's a warrant out for him. He didn't, they didn't want him. So he showed up for his normal weekend jail. No consequences, no extra time, no fines, no new charges for that. But I'm denied that for legitimate work reasons. So if it can happen to me, it can happen to anyone. And that that's where I really get concern for the general public at large, you know, about the attacks on LGBT folks. I know you were bringing some of that up and some other folks were, you know, uh, they don't have the right to try to stop someone from beating them. If they do, they're the ones who go to prison. I don't care if you're black. I don't care if you're Asian, Islander, native, transgender, non-binary, gay, straight. Everybody should have the right to defend themselves against that sort of thing. And I don't care who the aggressors are, whether it's Antifa, whether it's the KKK, whether it's just some street gang wanting to cause trouble, whether it's some guys who need money for their fix, they're sort of trying to rob you. This affects everybody to the core. So we are now in the appeals process. My attorney on the appeal is Robert Barnes. He's uh, an attorney to the stars of sorts out of LA. He's representing some of the Covington kids actually. Um, he's not the one I had on the trial. That's a talk for a different day. Um, so in the appeals process, you're not necessarily going back. And I wish Sergeant Halliburton were here for, to show the video. Um, you're not necessarily going back and re-arguing the case. You're not going back and 
looking back over evidence or arguing innocence or guilt. You're uh, addressing errors that were made on the trial level by the judge. Now, most of these cases that I've seen as I've investigated these involve one assignment of error, as I call it. My case involves six. <laughs> We're limited to 10,000 words. It would have been probably a dozen if it wasn't for the word limit. So the things we've raised on the appeal, all, uh, major, um, several of them center around my state of mind. Again, the judge denied all those motions that relate to my mindset and what I was thinking at the time. And because of the case law precedent set in Oliphant and Wood, self-defense is purely in the state of mind of the person who's raising self-defense. So change of venue is our first one for assign, uh, assignment of error. Uh, what happened to my arm and the fact that that was ruled inadmissible, which certainly plays into my mindset. That's one of our things. Um, the definitions of unlawful use of a weapon that we that the state refused to clarify because in our point of view that left me with an impossible defense because I didn't know what I was defending myself against. Uh, the statements to my to the detectives, uh, the ambush witness we uh, argued as an error because there actually are uh, not only laws uh, involving that regarding proper procedures, but also case law state v flag air. Is a state law involving that where um, they can't present ambush witnesses? And uh, the First Amendment restrictions. So those are our six uh, assignments of error. Now, the appeals court relies on uh, typed out transcription of everything. Um, we're not going back and listening to the audio. I have the audio from the whole thing. Um, uh, you, someone has to type it all out. They have to listen to the audio and type it all out. Uh, so that was ordered right away in May, I think, maybe June of 17. Um, the trial was February of 2017. Um, the sentencing was uh, May 3rd of 2017. So we filed our appeal in timely manner later in May. The transcriptions were ordered, and it took them four months to get us the transcripts. My appeals attorneys say they've never seen anything like that take so long. Uh, we filed everything in a timely manner. They're allowed to take all that long. They're allowed to continually ask for extensions. Uh, so we finally get the, uh, the transcription and we put together our written um, brief and we submit that in a timely manner, which was then, so we, we got the transcriptions in October of 17 and we got our um, written brief in, in mid-December, I think which then puts the state on the clock for 45 days to submit their response to our motion. So that puts them out to late January. And then I'm told in late January that the state, uh, person handling the state here, Susan G. Howe, has now filed a 131 day extension of time for her to put together her response. She writes in her motion that, that I agreed to it, that she spoke with, with the um, appellate attorneys, that she spoke with the appellant, me, and that we agreed to that. My attorneys were never contacted about that. So, so the judge, Judge Egan, on the appeals court, he takes that at face value. I'm not debagging on uh, Egan because all he had is what was written in the motion there. So he signs off on the 131 day extension. Meanwhile, my life's hanging in limbo through all of this. Um, so that puts it out to June at some point. So she finally submits her thing along with the motion to exceed the word limit by 2,000 words. We kept ours at 10,000 words. She wants to, she needs 12,000 words to retort the arguments we were making. Judge approves it. So we're noticing now that they're playing it a little fast and loose with the rules, which I don't necessarily have a problem with as long as they're fair about it. 